It is my great honor and pleasure to give the 2022 George C. Marshall Lecture on Military History. My name is Sally Payne or SCM Payne in my publications. I'm the William S. Sims University Professor of History and Grand Strategy at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Before I get going, I've got to make a disclaimer. The ideas that I'm about to present are my ideas. They're not necessarily the ideas of the U.S. government, much less the Department of Defense, the U.S. Navy Department, or the U.S. Naval War College where I work. I am going to give a lecture entitled Centuries of Security, Chinese, Russian, and U.S. Continental versus Maritime Approaches. And it's based on a 20-year career plus and counting in the strategy and policy department at the Naval War College, which is the only institution of higher learning to focus on the prerequisites and strategic possibilities for maritime power. When I began my career, I spent a year in the Soviet Union when it was, and then eight years in various countries in Asia engaged in archival research. When I came to the Naval War College, I realized belatedly that I had learned a great deal about two continental empires, Russia and China, but all the case studies I was supposed to be teaching had to do with maritime powers, principally the United States and Great Britain. I knew nothing about the Navy. So my husband who also works at Naval War College got me to co-edit a whole bunch of books on different Naval operations, on blockades, peripheral operations, all sorts of things that made me think about the world in a different way. And today, I am going to focus on geopolitics, what opportunities does geography open and what does it foreclose? And now to get going with the main event. This is June 6, 1944, where maritime power met continental power with the Normandy landings. Maritime powers are the exception. Continental powers are the rule. Maritime powers, if need be, can defend themselves primarily at sea, whereas continental powers cannot. Therefore, a wise maritime power invests in a competent navy and a wise continental power has a competent army. And these differences have profound military, political, and economic implications that I'm gonna go into. So this is the first distinguishing characteristic of continental versus maritime powers, the inability or ability to defend by sea, and therefore which military service you invest in. The United States began its career as a continental power. And here you see President James Monroe who enunciated one of the most famous continental doctrines there is, the Monroe Doctrine, which informed the Europeans that they had better stay clear of the Americas. This, this was gonna be the US sphere of influence. This is a classic continental power, sphere of influence, stay out of my area doctrine. Uh, the only hitch was that he couldn't enforce it, but never mind. But what he did do was negotiate with Britain to straighten the border in the north, and he negotiated with the Spanish, so the United States wound up with Florida. The United States, unlike a typical continental power, preferred checkbook diplomacy to the massed armies approach, so that when Napoleon Bonaparte ran short of cash, that's when the United States made the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. And when Tsar Alexander II ran short of cash, that's when the United States purchased um, Alaska and then the part of the Northwest Coast. But when the checks were rejected, which is what the Mexicans did, the United States did the typical massed army approach. And that was the Mexican-American War that netted the United States, Texas. The Mexicans accepted the next check offered, which was the Gadsden Purchase where the United States acquired Tucson, Arizona, and other places. The US Army completed the conquest of the West. This is the longest war in US history. It is not the recent events in the Middle East. The native inhabitants put up a bitter fight to retain their lands and they lost. 1890 is when wounded knee happens. The Americans had a name for their foreign policy and they're really proud of it. They called it Manifest Destiny. The idea that it was the manifest or obvious fate of the United States to take over a good part of the Americas. And this lovely painting, today it hangs in the staircase and the Western entrance into the chamber of the House of Representatives. 
And today it's referred to by its co politically correct name, which is Westward Ho. Well, here's the real name. Westward, the course of empire takes its way. Back in the 19th century, Americans were all about territorial expansion and proud of it. But the year the conquest of the West is completed is the year that Alfred Thayer Mahan publishes his seminal book, The Influence of Sea Power on History, 1890. It comes out and Mahan is by far the most uh, famous faculty member ever associated with Naval War College. And Mahan's looking out at the world in his day and he says, you know, power and position in the world is not actually a function of continental consolidation so much as it is a function of the wealth that can accrue from oceanic trade. And he were, thought there were six prerequisites to be a full-fledged maritime power. And here they are. First, you need to have a moat. You need relative protection from anyone who might be trying to invade or cause you problems. Secondly, you need to have a dense internal transportation grid to get the goods out in peacetime. And you need reliable egress by sea so you can get the Navy out in work time. You can't be surrounded by narrow seas that are blockadable. You also need a dense coastal population. These are the people who are going to be engaged in the trade, commerce-driven economy and stable government institutions that are gonna promote and protect, protect commerce and also fund a big Navy. If you look at these prerequisites and apply them to China and Russia today, well, neither China nor Russia has a moat. In fact, they both have more neighbors than any other two countries there are. Russia most certainly does not have a very good internal transportation grid. China's is getting much better. Neither one has reliable egress by sea, because they are surrounded by narrow seas, cluttered with islands and way too many neighbors that might be hostile or they're frozen seas that no one much uses. And uh, Russia's never had a commerce driven economy. China has historically in the Maoist period not, and then it was staging a comeback. And now Xi Jinping is turning to privilege the crony sector over the pri private sector. And we'll see how that plays out. But neither Russia nor China has stable institutions. And the litmus test for that are regular and transparent transitions of power. And dictator for life does not remotely qualify. So Russia and China are two great continental powers with maritime aspirations. And it's unclear whether they understand the limitations of playing the maritime game. Now, there was a a uh, counter argument to Mahan enunciated a generation later by a Briton, Sir Halford Mackinder. And here's a map from his seminal publication, an article published in 1904. And he looks at the world and he thinks the prime geopolitical location is actually this pivot area, what he called the heartland. It corresponds to Russia. And he thought this was a better position than what Britain had. And he said, it's because this is the citadel of land power on the great mainland of the world. It's the greatest natural fortress on earth, insulated it as it is by mountains, deserts, frozen seas, or river system dead ending into these narrow or frozen seas. He said, look, this area is impervious to sea power. And indeed, it's a large area, so it has the possibility for defense in depth, strategic ret retreat, and self-sufficiency. It is an area insulated not by the sea, but from the sea. And if Britain wanted to influence Russia, the pivot area, it was going to have to do it on the periphery, what he would call the inner marginal crescent, through having either colonies there or an own day basing on the edges of Eurasia to influence it. Nicholas Spikeman was also terribly concerned about who controlled the heartland, and he got more, even more interested in the Rimland, the coastline of the heartland. And he had much to be concerned about the year he died and also the year his most famous work came out. He's a naturalized citizen from the, of the United States, but from the Netherlands, which was then under Nazi occupation. Here was his take. Despite occupying the safest position of any nation in the world, we Americans have been involved in two devastating world wars in the space of a quarter of a century. And the second one, we were at one point in serious danger of defeat, i.e. in the ongoing war. The expectations of U.S. statesmen regarding the outcome of their actions were consistently wrong, and their thinking about national security generally failed to provide successful answers. 
He continued, the influence of the United States can be brought to bear on Europe and the Far East only by means of seaborne traffic, and they can only get to us by crossing the sea. And this is true in spite of the growing importance of air power, because the preponderant element of, in the transport of all but the most specialized items will continue to be by sea. That's because big things go by sea, small things by air. It is still true in our own day. Therefore, according to Spikeman, U.S. security was a function of its maritime power and sanctuary at, at home was a function of this maritime shield. And he was terribly concerned about who controlled the Rimlands. He said the United States will have to depend on her sea power communications upon, across these great oceans to give her access to the old world. The effectiveness of this access will determine the nature of her foreign policy. Neither of the maritime powers, Britain or the United States, can exert her armed strength, strength fully except through a continental ally who can provide a base from which land power can be exercised. In other words, victory in World War II was going to depend on alliances and connecting up with a great continental power. Here's my real plan today. I'm gonna to give a presentation in three parts. I'm gonna start out with continental powers because in human history, they come first. And afterwards, maritime powers develop. At the Naval War College, we like animals, uh, hope you do too. And we often refer to continental powers as elephants and maritime powers as whales, bonus terminology. After I discuss those two types of empires, I'm then gonna to turn to the industrial revolution and the post-World War II institutional settlement that upended empires of both types and ushered in the maritime global order that has been developing in our own day. The original continental empire would be China. So I shall start with China. Sun Tzu in his Art of War provides advice for the rulers of China. In his day, there were kings over competing kingdoms, many of them, any of which could invade at any, any time. And Sun Tzu's advising them how to stay on the throne, how to defeat neighbors, and how to do so cost effectively. If one reads on Art of War, one no, will notice that there's no reference to naval warfare and only a couple of references to riverine warfare. And this is for very good reasons. This is in a world, a world in existence long before maritime empires ever came into existence. And it's a world all about fighting for territory, annexing things, ingesting them, homogenizing them, and imposing a rule system on whatever your empire winds up being. And if you think about the great civilizations of Eurasia, many of them at their basis are great continental empires. And a civilization answers the questions, how should I live? How should I interact with others? And great civilizations have often fought to make their rules universal. China's problem has been invading, invading barbarians, who like people of recent times have all coveted Chinese manuf manufacturers back in the day, they came from the North. Often China's probably the greatest empire in human history, a status that it retains with its continuing occupation of Mongol, Tibetan, Tibetan and Muslim lands. This here is a precipitation map. You can see areas that are awfully dry to grow things. Here is a temperature map. These are areas pretty cold to live in. Here's a topographic map, and those are the areas that are, are flat and most suitable for agriculture. Here's an even better topographic map. And what it shows is why famine has been a problem for much of Chinese history and in our own day, why China is heavily reliant on food imports. It's simply too much of its real estate is vertical. Here is an ethnic map. You can see all that consolidated pink area. That is where the Han, the preponderant ethnic group of China live. They're surrounded by all sorts of diverse ethnic groups. Here's a simplified ethnic map and you can look at it and go, okay, China proper, that's where the most, the best arable land is. And it's also where the Han dominate. And the curious might ask, how exactly did the Han wind up, wind up with the prime real estate? And the answer would be they laid waste to the competing uh, Tibetan, Dzungar empires, and many other ethnic groups that started up much further north than where they are today. And they were faced with a binary choice. Either 
adopt Han ways or they will kill you. Or you had better just get out and flee to somewhere else. I bet many of you have never heard of the Zungars. Well, the Han took care of them a long time ago. Genocide is what happens to the losers of continental empire. And apparently the Uyghurs are slated for genocide in our own day. Here is a sanitized version of Chinese history. The Han began you know, in the Yellow River Valley and they spread and they spread and they spread and they built walls and more walls and were spreading and spreading and woo, a lot of shrinking. And then they're back contorting, consolidating and then much shrinkage and consolidation before the Yuan dynasty. The way this map portrays the Yuan dynasty, it's just one more Chinese dynasty. It's just bigger, except the Yuan weren't Han. They were Mongol. The Han were a subjugated people. This is a great discontinuity in Chinese history that the Chinese prefer not to acknowledge. Here's the real story of the Yuan. It is, they are the largest empire in Chinese history, bar none. The Mongols start out the east of Lake Baikal. They're moving across the Eurasian plain in another era of climate change. They're going out in concentric circles in order to get their herds initially to places where they all wouldn't starve. And then they run into countervailing population centers. So the Han are back with the Ming dynasty, but then the Ming succumb to a second conquest dynasty, the Qing dynasty. And the Qing are not Han, they're Manchus. And this is the second largest empire in Chinese history. So when the Chinese today claim what their historical lands are, they will look to either the Yuan or the Qing dynasty when quite ironically, the Han, the Han were a subjugated people. But my real purpose for showing all these maps is to show lots and lots of expansion, lots and lots of shrinkage and lots and lots of bloodshed as these changes are taking place. The Chinese have been raising armies denominated in hundreds of thousands for thousands of years. The West doesn't do this, or at least certainly not on a regular basis until the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, this is a world that is not for the faint hearted. Mackinder didn't pay much attention to China because in his day, it was a failing state in free fall. The continental empire that he cared about was Russia. And he's looking at railway systems. And he's thinking when Russia has a unified rail grid, these internal lines of communication are going to trump Britain's external lines that are all by sea. Russian expansion is like Mongols in reverse. The, you get Muscovy, which conquers the surrounding princely states. The fur trade is then very lucrative, gets people all the way out to the Pacific coast. And the Russians keep going until they run into countervailing population centers. And here's what they did administratively. These are, these are civil administrative boundaries. They're provinces or governorates, according to the, what the Russian terminology. You can see Moscow, the historic capital. These provinces are pretty small around Moscow, but the further out you get, the bigger they get. And this is an even clearer provincial map, but there's something going on. So there are also the provinces, but there's these invisible gray fonts and they're for oblasty. Oblasty are for the recently conquered, people who've been ingested, but not completely digested. And part of the absorbing occupied areas is you put them in these transitional administrative units to try to homogenize them, eventually turn them into regular governorates. And there's a second piece to this. There are military regions that are superimposed above it all as well, governor generalships, and look where they are in Tsarist Russia, Finland, Poland, Ukraine, Caucasus, Turkestan, and Siberia. These are the conquered peoples. And it's a proper, uh, a process of homogenizing people. And if they won't homogenize, at least you're gonna neutralize them. You're gonna garrison the empire. China has used changing uh, administrative zones for exactly the same reason. They've had changing provincial boundaries and changing military regions for exactly the same reasons. It's how you hold on to territory. Now, the advantages of the central position that Mackinder was emphasizing come with the, the disadvantage of multiple neighbors. And these are Russia's no kidding security threats circa 1900. And there are lots of them, west to east, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Ottoman Empire, British Empire, China, and Japan. The Russians have fought horrendous wars repeatedly with Germany, Austria, Hungary, the Ottoman Empire. Um, they suffered catastrophic defeats to the Swedes, 
to the Mongols, initially to Napoleon, to the Germans, and most recently in the Cold War. And each time their central position allowed them to rise. Again, this security world is very different from Britain's 360 degree, you can't get me moat. Lots of people have come to get Russians over the years. In this world, power is a function of land. Neighbors are dangerous. Even if they're little neighbors, little unstable neighbors, that instability can bleed over the border and that's a problem. Stable neighbors can be worse if they're bent on empire and taking over your own territory. So in this world, the purpose of the army above all is to protect the ruling regime. It's to keep the ruling regime in power. So if you're thinking People's Liberation Army, its number one mission is to keep the Chinese Communist Party in power. The second mission is to garrison the empire, prevent any defections. And then thirdly is border defense right up on the border. If you think about the purpose of an army for a maritime power, it's expeditionary. The whole point is you cross the seas, that's the expedition, and then you deploy there to do whatever is gonna happen. Well, in this world, there aren't any away games like that. They're all home games and the winner takes the field. And to give you a sense of the cost of a home game main front, here are the deaths in World War II. Take a look at Axis military deaths. 3.2 million dead German soldiers, one and a half million dead Japanese, third of a million Italians. Now let's look at the allied land powered military deaths. Eight and a half million dead Russians, nearly a million dead Poles, 1.3 million dead Chinese, and then a third of a million dead Frenchmen. Now let's compare the maritime powers. Britain and the United States, by some statistics, suffered fewer military deaths than either Italy or France. And France was not in the war that long. If you add in the civilian deaths, the numbers become even more skewed. Take a look. German deaths, 7 million. Soviet deaths, 25 and a half million. Poles, nearly 7 million. China, 11 and a third million. France, nearly a million. Uh, continental power deaths are denominated in millions, not hundreds of thousands. Theirs is a really different security world. The fighting tends to happen on their borders. If it goes badly, it's gonna be on home territory and you're gonna be hemorrhaging civilian deaths. No country in its right mind wants to fight on the main front, home front, if there are alternatives. And this is the agony of a continental power. And you can think of Ukraine today. If Russia invades, Ukraine's got two choices, either fight or capitulate. A maritime power insulated by the oceans and looking at continental, uh, looking at allies having troubles, it's a great matter of strategy to determine, A, if you're gonna intervene, and then if you decide that you are, when, it, when exactly is it gonna take place? Perhaps you don't have to think about the Cold War. All right, but there's certain advantages to winning on the main front, home front, and then expanding outwards. If you, lots of Russians died in World War II, but from Stalin's point of view, wherever the Red Army was, it occupied territory. And so Russia dominates Eastern Europe as long as it keeps its armies there. But beware, highly effective, but incredibly expensive. The value of the object had better be worth it. There are certain rules to survive in this lethal security environment. Rule number one for continental empires, no, no two front wars. You have multiple neighbors. If they gang up on you, it could all be over. Secondly, no great power neighbors. Why? Because today's friend can be tomorrow's foe and that spells trouble. So what do you do? You take on neighbors sequentially. You set them up to fail. You destabilize the rising, you ingest the failing and you set up buffer zones in between. You wait the opportune moment to pounce and absorb. This is Vladimir Putin's game. Better yet, you get the neighbors to squarrel among themselves. You sow their mutual resentments, deluge them with fake news and get them really squabbling. This allows Russia to play the role of the jackal state to intervene at the opportune moment to steal a kill made by others. But there's a problem in the modern era with this security paradigm because if this is how you exercise your foreign policy, you're gonna surround yourself by failing states. And then you can take a look at Russia and China 
and they are surrounded by some of the most dysfunctional, unstable places there are. And you can ask yourself, well, are they unlucky or are they complicit? Moreover, in this world, there's no enduring alliances because the hegemonic power offers people nothing but trouble in the long term. Moreover, it offers no counsel on when to stop. And so there's a tendency for overextension, which may help explain the periodic catastrophic defeats that Russia and China have suffered over the courses of their long histories. But before you dismiss the security paradigm, be aware, prior to the Industrial Revolution, it was highly effective. Uh, counter uh, insurgencies, no problem in this world. You just kill all the insurgents and extras. Who cares about collateral damage? This paradigm is all about wrecking things to get territory. And you have seen it operating in real time. In Aleppo in 2016, in Mosul 2017, and in Idlib in 2018 and 2020. This is why all the ancient ruins are ruins. This kind of warfare is ruinous. And here is Vasily Kluchevsky. He's one of the finest historians of the late Tsarist period, and he's writing about his own country. And he says, the history of Russia is the history of a country in the process of colonizing itself. Her area of colonization grows in tandem with her national territory, at times shrinking, at times growing, and it continues forever. Therefore, the periods in our history are the stages which our people have gone through in the occupation and development of the land acquired by them. Kuchaski is describing a world where if you have little unstable places, you had better take them over or someone else will, or heaven forbid they become powerful in their own right. Go back a generation. Here is Fyodor Dostoevsky, the, the great novelist, author of Crime and Punishment and other light reads. And here he is confiding in his diary. In Europe, we were hangers on and slaves, whereas we shall go to Asia as masters. In Europe, we were Asiatics, whereas in Asia, we too are Europeans. Our civilizing mission in Asia will bribe our spirit and drive us thither. A generation later, here's one of the finest statesmen of the late Tsarist period, uh, finance minister, Count Sergei Vita. In 1903, he's looking out at the world and here are his recommendations. The problem for Russia is to obtain as large a share as possible of the outlived Oriental states. And he's thinking of the Ottoman Empire, but most particularly on China. Russia, both geographically and historically, has, been the, undisputed, has the undisputed right to the lion's share of the expected prey. We've been doing this for a long time. The absorption by Russia of a considerable portion of the Chinese empire is only a question of time unless China succeeds in protecting itself. So here you have someone speaking at the highest levels of the Russian government, and he's looking at Russian foreign policy in terms of territorial expansion. So too, apparently does Vladimir Putin. And here's the problem for the likes of Putin. If a continental power botches strategy, its known world can vanish forever. And this is what happened to Imperial Russia, Imperial China, and to many great civilizations of Eurasia. Here you see an aristocrat's whimsical palace. Well, the people who built this are long gone as a result of one of the greatest genocides of the 20th century, when the Bolsheviks made good their promise to eliminate entire social classes, which they did in a combination of the Bolshevik revolution, the ensuing civil war, followed by collectivization, and then the great purges that finished the job. The continental world is a world without insurance policies. Maritime world is very different. Here you can see the Atlantic, the center of the world economy in the 19th century. You can see all this wealth producing trade that is generated from the Rimlands but then it's traversing the seas, the oceanic commons. And think about it in our own highly networked age, the seas are the world's original network, potentially connecting everyone to everything. The Athenians of ancient Greece are the pioneers of maritime empire and their empires, one of these Rimlin empires clinging the shores of the Aegean and Ionian seas. In fact, go forward to the Roman Empire. It is another Rimland Empire, very different from the consolidated empires of Russia and China. 
and think about the terminology, Mediterranean, meta middle, Terranian land. So it's the sea in the midst of the lands versus the name for China, Zhong Guo, Zhong, central Guo kingdom. It's a kingdom among the kingdoms. One piece of terminology emphasizes the centrality of the seas and the other, the centrality of the land. The Byzantine Empire, also a Rimland Empire. But then no one controls the Rimlands anymore. And part of what's going on has to do with the east-west trade going along the Silk Road. There has been lots of money to be made on this east-west trade, and it used to go along the Silk Road, and whoever controlled its western term terminus was really rich because that's where the Silk Road splits and goes northward into Europe or southward into Africa. And there has been much fighting over that piece of real estate. For a while, the Muslim conquest settles that matter. They control it. And meanwhile, there is a, a continental consolidation going on in Europe. Both modern Germany and modern France trace their origins to the conquests of Charlemagne at the turn of the eighth to the ninth centuries. When you get up to the end of the first millennium, you look at Europe, a lot of large consolidated continental states, no one's controlling the Remlins. And in part, the Crusades are a fight for the Remlins and see if you can recapture the ultimate toll booth on the Silk Road. The Ottomans settle that matter for a number of centuries, they control it. And so the Europeans need to get clever if they wanna access trade with Asia. And so the Spanish and Portuguese decide they're gonna go the long way around, except they bump into the new world new to them. And then they run into gold and silver. And so no long, they're no longer interested in the, in the silks and the high-end dinner, dinnerware. They're now gonna be worried about heavy metal. It's the Dutch who, whose empire is really defined by their trading ports. And what the Dutch really want to do is to be able to trade in peace and share the oceanic commons. And it's not surprising that the founding father of international law comes from the Dutch Republic, Hugo Grotius. And he writes in Mara Liberum or Freedom of the Seas, every nation is free to travel to every other nation and to trade with it. In his law of war and peace, he cites a Ro Roman jurist, to all men belong the use of the sea. And then he cites a Byzantine recodification of Roman law. By natural law, the falling are common to everyone, the air, flowing water, the sea, and in consequences, the seashore. Maritime powers have been interested in expanding the reach of international law and in more recent times, international institutions so that they can share the commons and trade in security. And so this view of the seas as commons, it goes way back in Western thinking to the Romans, but it doesn't necessarily go back in other people's thinking. For instance, in 1996, China ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas or UNCLOS, but China's interpretation of that document is that freedom of, na of navigation does not extend within 200 nautical miles of its coastline. Well, according to UNCLOS, the number is 12 nautical miles. And in the East and South China Seas, the numbers make a difference. The real pioneers of maritime empire are the British because the Netherlands, their exposed position in Europe left them prey, let them prey to great continental neighbors. So it, it's the British are the ones with a 360 degree moat who don't have to have this large army to protect themselves. Everyone else in Europe has got to have a big army or someone's going to invade. Britain, if it maintains a big navy, anyone who's trying to get to Britain has to cross the sea and that navy will sink those ships at sea. So that Britain can turn a weakness, its dependence on trade into a strength. While all of its continental neighbors are busy destroying each other, destabilizing each other, fighting, destroying wealth at a clip and armies running coups and who knows what's going on, the British can focus on compounding wealth. So although the uh, Navy can prevent others from invading Britain, in that sense, it's a prevent defeat strategy, they cannot, a Navy alone cannot defeat Britain's continental adversaries. But Britain has a prevent defeat the strategy in place. And so if it keeps compounding wealth while its neighbors are destroying wealth, that will mean time will join Britain's side. And Britain took quite a while developing a grand strategy of how to utilize various 
instruments of international power. It, it would it occurred when this gentleman on a horse, Napoleon, gave them much food for thought. And after much trial and much error, Britain and Napoleon's other neighbors, after a series of six failed coalition, finally the Capstone Alliance figures out how to, to unseat Napoleon. And the British uh, developed grand strategy. Why? Because navies in wartime are rarely decisive. You've got to integrate naval power with other instruments of strategy, make that strategy not operational, but grand. And here's what Britain figured out in that department. It's, here's the problem before Nap Napoleon gets going is you have consolidated states east and west, a large tidbit zone in the middle. Napoleon takes the tidbits. Here's his maximum territorial extent, 1812. This is when uh, Clausewitz, the great guru of land warfare and Western thinking is getting much food for thought. And the British are also getting much food for thought of how to leverage their maritime instrument of power. And here's what they figure out for elephant hunting, how you deal with rogue elephants. First, rule number one is keep the economy growing. Whatever you do, you've got to have the money from commerce and other things to fund your own military, your allies' militaries, et cetera. Rule number two, don't let the, the elephant forage. You want to close down enemy trade through blockade that throws its back in, onto its own dwindling resources and onto its incre increasingly bitter, embittered allies and occupied areas. Rule number three, you wanna rent an elephant. You wanna find the continental power most directly threatened by your continental problem. And you wanna arm and fund that continental power that's gonna be fighting on the main front because they simply can't avoid it. Rule number four is Britain needs to find a peripheral theater. Uh, while it's a main allies fighting on the main front, Britain's gonna find a theater peripheral to the main theater, the accessibles by sea, and it's gonna leverage the easier transport by sea in order to inflict casualties on the continental problem. It's gonna force the continental problem to fight on divided attentions. And if you have that continental fi power fighting on multiple fr fronts, you're gonna overextend them. Rule number five, a rule that Britain ignored at its peril in World War I at great cost, don't take on the enemy main force directly, certainly not as your opening uh, move. A continental power's main strength is its army. That's not Britain's main strength. Britain's main strength, whether it's Navy, it's trade, it's ability to ge generate wealth, use those things. Don't go, uh, don't take your weak suit, your army and go after the enemy's strong suit, which is its army. Rule number six, fight on that main front only late in the war after you've really bled the enemy elephant and only do so with lots of friends. As much as a continental power might wanna do this, its naval, uh, its geopolitical access to the seas is going to be inadequate. They're probably surrounded by narrow seas. Moreover, they probably have a surfeit of neighbors, have too many neighbors, who knows who's going to invade, so that you cannot use this paradigm. But if Britain followed the paradigm, it could set in motion a virtuous circle of pernicious effects on its enemies and put itself and its enemies on opposing trend lines. Because while Britain has sanctuary at home, this war is increasingly encroaching on the enemy territory, undermining the enemy economy, productive base, standard of living, hurting enemy morale, which together is gonna to destroy the enemy ability to wage war. This is a strategy of protracted war to win by exhausting the enemy first. Note that it, the focus not so much on the military instrument of national power, but on economics, coalitions, and institution buildings, and there are certain prerequisites for it. For it. You gotta have sanctuary at home. You gotta have an untouched industrial base. You need access, access to markets, access to theaters, access to allies, and you need institutional ability, uh, stability at home to run a long-term foreign policy. And these are some of the, the features and characteristics that Mahan would later emphasize uh, for a maritime power. After the Napoleonic Wars ended, there was not a general war in Europe until World War I. This was a century of unprecedented economic growth. There were some regional wars, but nothing, no big, big war. And Europeans got rich following a maritime power paradigm focused on making money from trade. And this brings me to the second distinguishing characteristic of continental versus maritime 
powers. It has to do with different threats and different perceptions. Continental powers face contiguous threats. They have to focus on national security. There's no avoiding this. And so it's natural that they're gonna focus on insulating themselves from their neighbors because their neighbors historically have been dangerous and wanting to set up exclusive zones to keep people out. Whereas maritime powers with the comparative security of a moat can focus on national prosperity and using this, pro this prosperity compounding wealth from trade in order to pay for your national security of helping your neighbor, uh, uh, allies and other things so that trade becomes the means for security and their focus is gonna be on access to markets. And from these two different pro preoccupations come two mutually exclusive world orders. One, a world cut up into different spheres of influence operating under different rules. And the other one, a world in which the seas are shared and people have the same rules for how you share those rules, uh, those seas. So the dis second distinguishing characteristic is a focus on insulation from landward neighbors versus sea access to markets and therefore a desire for closed versus open seas. Well, the industrial revolution upends empires of both flavors because it introduces economic growth whose compounding effects are revolutionary. The industrial revolution is well-named and it begins in England and then it spreads to the continental, continental Europe after the Napoleon Wars end and it's been making its way, way around the world ever since. It's based on a combination of institutional and technological changes in its early phases on steam power, iron industry, textiles, insurance, and banking, later stages on railways, telegraphs, steamships, mass markets, trade, armaments, general staffs. What's going on is the currency of international power has changed. In the past, the currency of power was land. Land is what got you the commodities you could sell, and it's from the land you get your peasant conscripts to field mass armies. Well, once you have compounded growth, all of power and wealth are now a function of industrialization, commerce, and trade. And it is a horrific event for traditional societies who had security paradigms who had worked, that had worked in the past. And suddenly they aren't working anymore. And it's just profoundly uh, destabilizing for them. And it ushers in a global order that is focused on setting the rules of international trade to minimize transaction costs. And you can see these trade, trade negotiations, they're still ongoing. But if you think about uh, people on the receiving end of this, for instance, ISIS or whatever's left of it, it wants nothing to do with these liberal societies and economies where these ideas come from. China back in the 19th century resisted this incoming maritime order and today remains profoundly ambivalent, ambivalent about the reach of international laws and institutions. When Mackinder looked at that big yellow area and he's thinking about railways, another product of the industrial revolution, he's looking at railways unifying a grid for Russia but there's another way of looking at this map. Notice there's the British, Roman, and Mongol empires, and they all share one key place, the Western terminus of the Silk Road. That's where so much money was made. That was the key piece of real estate if you could own that in the continental uh, or imperial era. Well, here's another piece of the Industrial Revolution to be the Suez Canal and it upends transportation costs. It is so much cheaper to send uh, goods east and west via the Suez Canal. That old Silk Road is done. No one's doing camels anymore. It's gonna be going by ship. And it's profoundly destabilizing for societies that have been reliant on the Silk Road. Fast forward a hundred years to the Six Day War when Israel fought Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. And as part of it, the Egyptians didn't want the Israelis using the Suez Canal, so they sunk a bunch of block ships. And they didn't remove those block ships until 1975. And that is a long time to tie up international commerce. So here's what's key to understand. The Suez Canal in those days could accommodate ships up to 50,000 deadweight tons. And prior to this war, that accounted for 90% of ships that there were. 
okay. Uh, after the canal opens, uh, most of world commerce is going to be going on big ships that never, ever existed before, and they don't remotely fit in the Suez Canal. And here's what shipping companies discovered when they were taking oil from the Persian Gulf to Rotterdam. What they learned is that their cost of doing this were more a function of ship overhead than distance traveled. That if you send the oil to Rotterdam on a little ship, it costs uh, over $13 per ton to do that. Whereas if you put it on a big ship, it's less than $5 a ton. And this revolutionizes transport. And then it's further accelerated by this general, gentleman, Malcolm McLean, who ran a trucking company. And he took its trucks minus the chassis, what we call containers, and they put, he put them on ships, stacking them both below decks and above decks. And when he did this, he reduced loading costs from almost $6 a ton to less than 20 cents. And also it meant that the port time for these ships was vastly reduced because it's so quick to load them. So they're out and about earning money most of the time. In addition, these container sizes were standardized globally in the late 60s to fit one if by, by uh, truck, two if by rail car, and thousands if by sea. So if you look at transport costs, over the course of the 20th century, they just plummet. And here is the problem for our latest dictator for life who thinks he's got that Belt Road Initiative, Xi Jinping. Here's the problem with those railway lines. Uh, if you look at tanker sizes up until 1960, the average size was 20,000 deadweight tons. Well, in our today, the smallest ultra large crude tankers are a quarter of a million deadweight tons. Whereas the largest or the, the longest trains can only bring, transport 600 containers, the biggest container ships can take over 21,000 containers and carry almost a billion dollars in cargo. So uh, not only is this so much cheaper, it's so much more secure to send things by sea. Think about Belt Road Initiative. Anyone who breaks it anywhere cuts that transportation route. And oh, by the way, Central Asia happens to be one of the more unstable places there are. It would be nice if that train line were all the same gauge, because otherwise you're unloading, loading, unloading, loading. Well, it's not all the same gauge. And it will be nice if it were continuous and it isn't continuous e either. There's some vertical missing sections. Uh, the sea route is the way to go. And it will be open to China and anybody else as long as we're all at peace. And the problem for China in wartime is it's surrounded by these narrow seas cluttered with islands and way too many neighbors who are increasingly hostile to China as it wrecks the environment of the South China Sea with all these island building that it's done. So that these are precisely the sort of seas that are either mined or blockaded and they're not accessible in wartime. So everyone's better bet is to remain at, at, at peace and share all of these seas. But Land transport is never gonna replace the sea transport. And if you look at our own times, one of the miracles is this incredible growth of international trade that has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, most particularly in China. And you can look at it when it takes off. It's at the end of the Cold War. Goodbye and good riddance Soviet Union. And the problem with Vladimir Putin is this growth is not taking place at Russian homes, but of the homes of those vested in this trading order, not in extortion. And this brings me to the third distinguishing characteristic between continental and maritime powers. This transportation revolution based on exterior lines of communication is so lucrative that for the continental powers who have focused on interior lines of communication in order to garrison their empires, to deploy armies against neighbors, and then have leveraged them for contiguous alliance systems. Well, this wealth producing world post-industrial revolution is based on these exterior lines, all about access to markets, access to wartime alliances, and also the possibility for a global alliance system. And this is the third distinguishing characteristic, a reliance on interior, versus exterior lines of communication and the alliance possibilities it gives you, contiguous or global. 
And these are the exterior lines that Spikeman emphasized. If you look at the Industrial Revolution uh, and uh, the transportation revolution that goes with it, those who are on the old Silk Road have never recovered. They, it, they remained as if stuck in some awful time warp, unable to get out of it. And the Industrial Revolution puts continental empires on notice, not only because a sea transport is so much cheaper than land transport, but because it opens the possibility of a positive sum world order. The traditional world of fighting uh, um, continental empires or continental states is negative sum at best. Why? Because when you're fighting each other, you're damaging the goods you're fighting over so that the winner's win is less than the loser's loss because the winner's taking all this damaged territory. And so at one level, yeah, you've got all these, these winds of taking territory, but you're destroying wealth at a rapid clip to get it. The maritime world is all about positive sum transactions. You want to trade. And that trade has got to benefit both parties. It's not the continental power of one side ruining the other. If you do that to your trading partner, they will never trade with you again. It's got to be win-win. It's about compounding wealth that we're all getting better off. And this way of organizing yourselves is based on freedom of navigation, free trade, international laws and institutions facilitating that trade in order to minimize transaction costs. And so the countries that are not maritime by ge geography, they can coordinate with each other and they can bring together numerous instruments of national power, not necessarily military, and use them to enforce the rules that protect them all in order to keep compounding the wealth. And there is an insurance system to this global emerging global order. And it was put in place by the greatest generation, which would be the World War I conscripts who came home to have their initial professional lives constrained by the Great, profession, Great Depression, but then they rose to strategic leadership in World War II. And they concluded that the solution to economic depression and global war was institution building on a global scale. And they created not only the UN, the IMF and NATO, but also the precursor institutions of the EU and the World Trade Organization. And this was their answer is that they would create these institutions that would hold the peace and they have held the peace in the industrialized world ever since. But the fighting continued in the unindustrialized world uh, in McKinder's inner marginal question, often on the, the periphery of the pivot area. Now, the maritime world is invisible and the continental world is highly visible. And here's why. The continental world is all about positive objectives. It's about taking territory, winning battles. Whereas the maritime world is often about negative objectives. And I will get into a negative objective is about preventing something from happening. So if you're successful and prevent something from happening, it's invisible. You can't prove, prove you did anything. Continental world, certainly at the operational level, it's all about operational wins. You defeat someone totally in warfare, but at the strategic level, you're destroying wealth in an incredibly rapid clip. The maritime world, it's all about preventing bad things from happening to disrupt the international trading order. And navies, most of the time, which is peacetime, but most of the time, not all the time, navies are concerned with negative objectives. They're preventing bad things from happening. Mission number one for the Navy is prevent anyone from destroying the global trading system. That will be a really high value mission. All of our prosperity depends on that. Rule number, uh, mission number two will be preventing limits on freedom of navigation. If you cannot get that trade through, then that trading system is going to have troubles. Another mission is deterring territorial expansion, certainly in coastal areas. And think about it. Sovereignty is the bedrock principle of international law. These are all really high value missions. But on a good Navy day, nothing 
happen. It looks as if the Navy's not doing anything when in fact, what it's doing is keeping the arteries of trade open. This is the lifeblood of the international system and powers vested in this system to prevent others from interfering with it. They form alliances, they exercise diplomacy, they impose sanctions, embargoes and contain continental problems and they use their navies to deter blockade and commerce raid. We all know that compounding growth is really powerful, but what people often don't think about is the growth that you prevent from happening, the negative objective. So that if you have a country that is trying to interfere with this uh, international trading system, you impose sanctions and embargoes, and maybe you shave one or 2% of growth from them per year. Those compounding effects are powerful. Just look at North and South Korea to see how it works over several generations. This is the reason why Putin is interfering so aggressively in Western elections and now really putting the pressure on Ukraine. The sanctions are wrecking him. Now, uh, sanctions do not remove the problem. The problem's still there, but what you're doing is if you keep growing yourself and your problem uh, is having trouble growing and the difference in your two economies grows over time, that's putting you in better shape. Now you might say, oh, well, wouldn't it be nice to eliminate the problem? Oh, okay, you're gonna eliminate the problem. It's called North Korea. They have nuclear weapons. Uh, fighting wars destroys wealth at an incredible uh, pace. If you want climate change, do a, a nuclear war. That is uh, not good strategic thinking. The three, the, in this world, it's not about those operational wins. It's about maximizing wealth, the strategic win. Now, the optimists at the end of the Cold War thought that it was going to be liberal democracy all around. And of course, that hasn't been the case, that this continental maritime difference of how things should be organized continues to the present. And I have here pictured in their native habitats, two of the great continentalists of our own time, Putin and Kim, uh, Mr. Fit and Miss Fit. And what they want to do is hollow out international law, degrade international institutions, wreck our alliance systems, and return us to a world of chock-a-block warring uh, spheres of influence to reduce us to living in the kind of squalor their own citizens have to endure. So to summarize, the difference between continental and maritime powers uh, is as follows. One, the inability or ability to defend primarily at sea. Two, a focus on insulation from versus access to the world. Three, a reliance on interior versus exterior lines of communication. And these accidents of geography cause certain preferences. A continental power looking at the world in terms of territory to take versus a maritime perspective of markets to make money, a continental approach or focus on economic self-sufficiency versus a maritime focus on access to markets, a continental emphasis on exclusive zone versus a maritime view of the oceans as commons, but also as air, um, the space and potentially cyber as common. Now, clearly most countries don't fit cleanly into a maritime or a continental power. So there's a corollary to all of this. Countries not strictly maritime by geography can exercise a maritime security paradigm by the friends that they choose and the international institutions that they choose to begin to uh, belong to. Of all countries that have benefited from a reconnection to the maritime world, China would be it. It has lifted hundreds of millions of Chinese out of poverty. Uh, China's um, continental heritage still looms large. Uh, the only war at way to sort these matters out is to share the oceans, to negotiate how we're going to interact with each other. Uh, the alternatives of fighting it out, they're all wealth reducing and potentially terminal for human beings. So thus concludes a lecture on applied history, history applied to the discipline of strategy. One of the best parts about teaching at the Naval War College is team teaching, not only with the active duty 
officers who I co-moderate seminars with, their careers don't remotely resemble my own. I've learned so much from them, but also my civilian colleagues whose expertise ranges then and now in all sorts of disciplines. Without them, how could I have learned to teach case studies on the Peloponnesian Wars, the Napoleonic Wars, let alone recent wars in um, Afghanistan and Iraq? In the lectures that we share and the case studies that we teach, uh, I've learned all sorts of analytical tools and uh, analytical approaches that have influenced my own research, the topics I write about and how I write about them. Students describe their year at the Naval War College as transformative, that they never think about the world in the same way, that they've been given all sorts of analytical tools that help them see the world in greater clarity. It's a sign of a good education. If I taught at a civilian university, I would gather together my colleagues to teach a big team talk course on the evolution of US institutions from the Iroquois to the present, to look at the continuities, the changes, the inflection points to the people who were behind the changes, the people who were resisting them, because I think it would be such an informative course for students and it'd be so much fun. One would learn so much from colleagues and it would emphasize not only political institutions, but judicial, legal, social, cultural, education, na educational, national, local, et cetera. And I think students of all disciplines would find it to be a course that they would remember for their entire lives. In addition, if I taught at a regular uh, university, I would be focusing on trying to revitalize history as a, a field and also as a, as a good uh, minor, not only as a major, but a minor for people in the social sciences and the natural sciences, that our country faces incredible problems. And there is much to be learned and insights to be gained from previous generations who also dealt with these problems. Also, history as a discipline is supposed to teach analysis, uh, application of evidence, and the art of the counter argument. And it is really useful for students to teach them not what to think, but how to think and analyze, and also how to express themselves eloquently, both verbally and in uh, the written word. Anyhow, it has been a great honor and pleasure to give this lecture. I so regret that we could not have met in person. If you would like to email me, I would love to connect with you. All you have to do is Google my name and Naval War College, and my work email will come right up. I answer my emails. And the only silver lining to this awful cloud uh, called COVID has been our mastery of Zoom so that we can connect with each other across the world instantly. So I would love to connect with you all. And it has been a great honor and pleasure to give the Marshall Lecture. Thank you so much for your attention.